Okay, everyone, we have Raphael here all the way from Holland, and he's got some system suspend support in the Linux kernel. Thank you. Oh. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Raphael. I work at Intel. Uh, I work mostly on power management and mostly in the Linux kernel. So uh, today, I am going to talk to give you a story, or to tell you a story, and uh, a story about the development of one particular power management feature in the Linux kernel, which is system suspend and resume. And, that, and the reason why I chose system suspend and resume is because it is, first of all, it is, it is sort of easy, easy to track changes in it, so you can just follow the development and see what happened. Second, it is self-contained, so it doesn't really uh, touch other features that much, and then uh, it is relevant. And, uh, and why it is relevant, I will tell you uh, later. So, uh, to start with, I would like to, uh, to give you some context uh, regarding what the system suspend is, where it fits in the, in the big picture, and so on and so on, so, so we can, you know, uh, to give you some understanding of, of this. So this diagram is, a, is an overview of, of, of uh, Linux power management, and of, uh, a very high level overview of, of power management of a system that is based on the Linux kernel that maybe uh, Linux like the desktop Linux I use, uh, or it may be Android or Chrome OS or similar, right? Anything that is based on the Linux, Linux kernel. So such a system may be either sleeping or working. If it is sleeping, then it is in one of the global uh, system-wide low power states, referred to as sleep states. And um, they are listed in this diagram uh, above the black line in the middle. And the uh, kernel can support up to four sleep states at the same time. Uh, as you can see, three of them are sort of referred to as suspend states. So, so, uh, so, so one, one, uh, one meaning of the term system suspend is just the sleep state uh, the system can be in. Um, there are a couple of, of uh, things that are common to all of the sleep states. So first of all, if the system is in a sleep state, uh, the uh, user, space, user space code cannot run. Yeah, the, the, in order to run user space code, the system has to, has to go out of the sleep, the sleep state. Second, uh, the activity of the system in a sleep state is reduced uh, pretty much so that it can detect events that, that uh, should uh, cause the system to go out of a sleep state. Uh, there are differences between them. So they differ first by the, uh, the amount of power that is necessary to maintain the given state. And that is sort of reflected by the width of the, of the permit at, uh, at a corresponding level, right? So either the wider the permit, the, the, the more power the, uh, is required to maintain the given state. Um, the second difference between them is the time, is, is the procedure by which the, the, it, that should be carried out to put the system into that state or to, to uh, bring it back uh, out of the state. So that's about sleep states. Um, if the system is not in a sleep state, it is working on, or, or, or it is in the working state. Uh, so the area of, of the graph or of the diagram below that black line is referred to as the working state. But the working state is not a single state. It actually is a, is, it, it's a meta state that covers the, the, the whole array of, of different configurations of the system. And um, different components of the system may be, may be active or inactive in different configurations. And if they are inactive or not in use, they are expected to be put into low power states individually. Like, uh, you know, sooner or later, like, after the period of inactivity, for example. 
there are two boundary configurations in the working state. So the runtime active configuration is, uh, is, is the configuration in which all the components are active. So everything is active. Uh, this, this corresponds to the maximum power draw of the system, and, uh, and that's why it is at the bottom of the pyramid. So you can also look at a pyramid like a diagram of how much time it takes to go from the runtime active configuration to, to a, say, uh, other configuration in the working state or, or to a sleep state, right? So the time is sort of reflected by the distance from the bottom of the pyramid to the given level. Okay, the, the other boundary configuration is a runtime idle configuration, which is which, which corresponds to, to the situation in uh, to, to, to all of the system components being being inactive. So they are all inactive. They should be low, in low power states, uh, and that is very very close to a sleep state. However, uh, user space is allowed to run in this configuration. So, for example, if user space uh, if user if a user space process sets up a timer. Uh, and the timer uh, expires, it will cause the, the user space process to run, to respond to the timer. On the other hand, in the sleep state, uh, the timers set up by user space are not taken into account at all. Either, they, uh, I, either the, the events don't happen at all, or, or, or they are just discarded. Which is why sleep state can generally uh, allow you to save more energy over time because even if the, the, the physical configuration in a sleep state is the same as, say, uh, runtime idle, uh, the system can stay in that configuration for a longer time in one go when it is in a sleep state. Okay, so this is just an overview. And now all of this means that there are two, two major power management strategies uh, that are supported by the Linux kernel. So the first one is based on using sleep states, right? So we can uh, put the system into a sleep state when we don't need to use, to, 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 to run user space processes, and it then stays in, in a sleep state for some time, and then it, it wakes up and then goes back to the working state. And that's referred to as the system-wide power management because sleep states are system-wide and global. The second strategy is based on uh, manipulating different components of the system in the working state, depending on whether or not they are in use. And this is referred to as the working state power management. So basically, this means that, of course, system suspend is part of the system-wide power management. Um, so why do we support the, the two strategies? And uh, the short answer is because they address different use cases. Uh, and that is sort of illustrated by this photo in, in, taken in Warsaw, Poland, where, where, which is where I live. And um, so, so the two key items in this photo are the ferry in the for foreground and the, the bridge in a, in a closed background. So they sort of represent two, two ways, two different ways uh, to get from one side of the same river to the other. <coughs> You can use a ferry or you can use a bridge. So the, now the question is, okay, so why do we need both? Well, because some people prefer the ferry and, and some people prefer the bridge. So say if you, are, if, you, if you drive a cargo truck, then using the ferry may not be an option at all. And if you ride a bicycle on a, on a, on a riverbank, then you may not want to you know, climb to the bridge through some stairs and, and carry the, the, the bike with you and so on. So there are different use cases and different ways to address them. So the same goes for uh, system-wide power management and, and working state uh, power management in Linux. So say if I close the lid of my laptop, it, it means that I'm not going to use it going forward. So all of user space doesn't need to run, so it can be put into a sleep state and stay in it for a long time. Now, if the lid is open, this usually means that I somehow use this laptop. And like right now, for example, I use it for displaying the slides, even though I'm not at the keyboard. So this is the case for, for uh, the working state power management. 
So even on the same system, both of them actually make sense in some situations. Okay, system suspend. So system suspend is, uh, first of all, it is, this term is used to, to refer to, to, to um, some of the sleep state, but sleep states. But second, it also is a procedure or, or a way to, um, to transition the system into a suspend sleep state. And that may be a full suspend state or a suspend to idle, and they are sort of different. I, I'm going to explain the difference between them shortly. So, um, yeah, there are two flows of control uh, allowing the system to go into, into a suspend sleep state. Uh, the full suspend is called this way because the, it may, in principle, allow the system to, to really draw a, 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 a very little power when the system goes into it. And, uh, and that's because the platform firmware is, or maybe, or should be probably involved in, in the whole procedure. And the second one is referred to as, to as suspend to idle because the last, uh, the, the last step of it is to put the CPUs into idle states in the same way as they are put into idle states in the, in the working state of the system. So let me walk you, walk you through the full suspend flow uh, in the first, or first, and then I will, I, will, um, I will talk about differences between them because they are, uh, there are visible differences, but they are, uh, otherwise the, the flows are similar. So the, the, all of it starts at the top, the working state is at the top here, okay? So it all starts from user space requesting a transition to, this, to a suspend sleep state. So user space has to say, okay, I'm not, I don't need to run anymore, and you can go into a sleep state. So the first step is to notify all of the uh, interested kernel subsystems that registers, registered notifiers that, uh, for power management that the system is going to go to a sleep state, and that allows those subsystems to also uh, to also fail the, 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 the whole transition or abort it if they, if they think that this is not the right time to do it. The second step uh, is called the freezing of tasks and this is, when, uh, this is what prevents the user space processes from running. So after that step is completed, uh, user space processes cannot run uh, or basically user space code cannot run. But processes are trapped inside of the kernel and they just wait for, for uh, until they, they are allowed to run again. I'm not going to go into details. To, the, the, there are some details about that, but uh, I, I don't have the time to, to cover them. So next, and that freezing of tasks, sorry, the freezing of tasks is, is, is the operation that allows us to, to get sort of rid of user space to take it out of the picture and, and, and we don't need to worry about it going forward. And going forward, we suspend devices. This is done in, in, in four phases. Every phase touches potentially every device in the system. However, usually they are only uh, touched by one or two phases. In each phase, devices are accessed through callbacks provided by uh, drivers, by bus types or device types or, or classes. And they, after all of that is completed, they should be suspended and they should be in low power states. So devices are basically inaccessible after this big uh, green um, rectangle. Next, the, all of the logical CPUs except for one are taken offline in this, pretty much in the same way as for uh, CPU hot plugs. So this, this causes uh, one, um, one logical CPU to be active uh, before the system core offline operation happens and then the uh, interrupts are turned off on this single CPU. So the last two steps are, are carried out with uh, interrupts disabled and uh, system core offline is just taking, uh, t just takes care of, of, of the very core components of the system like an interrupt controller and similar. 
And the platform offline is basically invoking the platform firmware to, do, to complete the operation. And because the platform firmware completes the operation, it has to take care of uh, uh, everything going forward, including setting up uh, wake-up events for the system. So the platform firmware actually sets up devices to wake up the system from the state, and, and then uh, when, when, the, when, when there is a wake-up event, it processes uh, this event uh, in order to decide whether or not it is a valid event, and then if it is, then it will invoke the kernel to uh, transition the system back to the uh, working state. And the resume transition is pretty much the reverse of the suspend one, so I'm not going to cover it in detail. Okay, so now suspend to idle is similar, but there are differences between the two. So the, the, the most important difference is that the platform firmware is not involved in, in the suspend to idle at all. It may be used by it if, if there is support, but it doesn't have to be used. Which means that basically the last step of it, which I said already, is that the, the CPUs are, uh, are put into, into idle states in the same way as in the working state. So, but through the uh, CPU idle subsystem, essentially. And they wait for interrupts. So these are not special wake-up events. These are just interrupts that can be generated by any devices. And, you know, usually we don't want every single interrupt to wake us up from a sleep state, right? So there, is, there has to be a way to, to um, you know, filter out the, the interrupts, the spurious events that we don't want to wake up the system. And this happens in this gray box, but <clears throat> also some of, some of the events actually need some um, processing in addition to, to just decided, deciding that the interrupt was a uh, wake up interrupt. Uh, because unfortunately, there are interrupts that are used to signal both wake-up events and non-wake-up events, and, and we need to distinguish between the two. So this is why we check again here if the event that we got is actually a wake-up event, and if not, the system goes back to sleep. That's a, uh, a, a major complication, by the way, uh, which is not present here because the platform firmware is there and it is expected to take care of it. Okay, so this is how it works today, okay? This is how it works today, uh, but it, first of all, I, I promised you a story. And second, uh, it is instructive to go back in, in time and see how things looked like, say, 10 years ago, and, and, and how we got from there to here. So, uh, let's go back. Uh, 2007. 620. Uh, there is one flow for system suspend. There is no suspend to idle still or yet. Uh, and you can sort of recognize the, all of the items that were pr present in the previous slide here. But first of all, there are fewer of them. And second, they are in a different order. Uh, also, there are those issues represented by the, by the um, purple balloons here. And the most important one is, is this. Uh, the, there were no graph GPU drivers in the kernel at that time. So the kernel couldn't actually reinitialize graphics uh, while resuming. And this means that the system wouldn't resume most of the time because the graphics was not working and also it wasn't, it could hang or similar and, and crash the system. There, was, there, were, there were ways to, to, to work around this. Like, for example, the platform firmware could be told that, okay, so when you resume, please reinitialize the graphics for us. It worked on some systems, it didn't work for other, on other systems. There were some other ways to, to reinitialize the graphics, like, say, after the, uh, completing the, whole, whole, the, the, the entire resume uh, path, the user space could do something sometimes to revive the graphics. And there were other methods. So the, the, there were systems that could actually suspend and resume, but there were a few of them, 
and we and and all of them required some some specific workarounds uh, to work. So there was like a whole whole list of of operations that had to be done on different systems to make the system suspend and resume work because of the graphics problem. Now you may notice that the, the CPU offline and online operations were, were uh, you know, uh, so that uh, non-boot CPUs were taken offline before freezing the, the tasks and, and then they were uh, put back online after that. So the idea was that, well, this is like CPU hot plug, sort of. So it can happen in the working state, and then everything can be, can be carried out as a, uh, as a sequential process on one CPU, so we don't need to worry about concurrency and things like that. So, well, fair enough, okay? So that was the idea at the time. What else? Here just two phases, and this one was a special one actually run with interrupts off, so it is more like system core offline than the device suspend. So there was one callback actually for every device, and, and moreover, this, th this was shared with hibernation, so, so system suspend and hibernation had the same infrastructure and in common, and which led to, 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 to a quite a bit of confusion about how to use that and you know, in which conditions and so on and so on. Okay, one important thing happened in uh, 2008, that's 2624. This is just the beginning of the year, so, so my, uh, my, um, I, I, look, I look at the first kernel in the given year to, to see what happens, so, you know, before that. So the graphics support is not there yet. But we reordered the C CPU offline and online with respect to device suspend resume. Uh, and, that, and actually, this wasn't done for a very good reason. It was like, yeah, we had some ordering issues with respect to some ACPI uh, methods that were called before, uh, before resuming devices. So we sort of reordered all of, the, all of the flow to avoid this problem, essentially. So it was not like a solid reason for doing something. <laughs> but but it, it had, it, as it turns out, and it will turn out just a bit later, that, uh, that it had a, 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 very, a, a very serious impact on, a, on the future development. So something like that could be done, like, yeah, we sort of didn't know what we were doing, but let's just do it because it works. And then it turns out the, that going forward, it actually matters. All right, 2009. The purple balloon is gone, right? Yay, we have GPU drivers, awesome. So now the graphics can be reinitialized, and suddenly there is a whole bunch of systems that, that didn't, couldn't suspend and resume before, and now can, and people start to use this feature. Well, guess what happens? If people start to use a feature like that, then they will see problems, right? Because then previously they didn't use it and they didn't care, and now, oh yeah, I can suspend my system maybe. Oh no, I can't. Uh, well, so in addition to that, we, we um, also separated the suspend and resume flow uh, from the hibernation f uh, flow, and that, and that simplified, um, simplified the development of drivers, because now people could support system suspend and resume without supporting hibernation. And on many systems that actually the hibernation doesn't matter or, or they decided that, well, yeah, we will support it later or something like that. And yeah, there is one more phase uh, in, the, in, the, in the suspend flow and in the resume flow. And this was added to address a specific problem where a device, uh, say a controller driver, uh, created children devices during system, system suspend, and then th those children devices were not handled properly going forward because they were created too late. So this phase was added just to ind indicate to drivers that, yeah, we are now suspending, so please don't create any more children objects. 
going forward. OK, and then people started to use it and then started to see problems and, of course, started to report, to report those problems. And we were in a situation where we, yeah, we, we, we knew that something was wrong, but we didn't know why. And, uh, and we didn't have access to all of those systems where it didn't work. <laughs> so obviously, we had to uh, find a way to get the information from them. And that's what was actually added. So we, we got some, tra uh, so some, some debug infrastructure for system suspend and resume, partly done by Linux, partly by me. And to allow people to, to report problems in, in a way that we could actually get some, in, some, some you know, idea about what is going wrong uh, from the reports. Well, on a laptop like this, for example, it is very hard if it, if it say, doesn't resume. It is very hard to say why it didn't resume. And it, it is very hard to get any kind of debug information from it because the only um, ports that it has are USB and they are not console USB. Let's just say they just are USB. And that's difficult to handle. Yeah? Um, some USB ports, the EHDR ports, uh, can be set up to actually pick up a recharge or something? So, so the question was that some, some USB ports may be set up to, uh, uh, to, to get some data out of them, and, and we, uh, uh, did we uh, consider this? Yes, we did. But the, actually, in this particular system, there are no such ports. <laughs> so. <laughs> okay, um, and the information that we got from people uh, through bug reports allowed us to uh, actually uh, find at least one pattern of failure that, uh, that could be addressed. And that pattern was, was related to the sharing of interrupts. So if you have two devices that share an interrupt, interrupt line, IRQ, and one of them is suspended, and the other one is not suspended yet, then very likely the, uh, the, the, the device that is not suspended can generate an interrupt, which then goes to the drivers of both devices. And if the driver that of the suspended device doesn't, doesn't know that or didn't, you know, uh, didn't um, mark the device as suspended, it would try to access it from its interrupt handler, because why not? And guess what? If the device has been suspended and is not accessible and it is accessed by an interrupt handler and which hangs, and then you know what happens, right? So this is one of the, one of the, one of the problems that we found. And, uh, and to address that, we actually used a, a, a sort of a clever observation about how interrupts are handled in Linux. So uh, there are two levels of interrupt handlers in it. So the first level is the low-level handlers that, that, uh, across the, that run at the, uh, at the chip, the IRQ chip level. And they are, they are responsible for essentially acknowledging their interrupts to the interrupt chips themselves. There is a second level called action handlers that are, that are run for devices, and these are code provided by device drivers, and they are responsible for acknowledging the interrupts at the source, which is the device that generates interrupts. So if you allow to, uh, to run uh, low-level handlers, but you block the action handlers at one point during the suspend transition, then the problems go away, right? The go, 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 problem goes away because then action handlers are not run. They will not access suspended devices and we can just avoid all of that without modifying drivers. That's what we did. So that's why the uh, suspend no RQ phase went up. And before that, we actually prevent action handlers from running anymore up until this point. Right, so this is the point where uh, action handlers can run again. So if the devices are, um, and the strategy is essentially this. In a suspend phase, we will prepare, uh, you know, stop all of the threads of the device, prevent DMA from happening, and so on and so on. But we won't turn the power off until the suspend or RQ phase. And now, 
during the suspend or RQ phase, we can safely turn the power off because then the action handlers won't run, so they won't access uh, suspended devices. Okay. In addition to that, uh, we got the runtime power management framework for, for IO devices, which was, which was an achievement by itself, but uh, so far it didn't really uh, interfere with this suspend resume thing that much. So, you know, we, we solved a couple of, of, of very important problems. So first, the graphics was now handled properly. Second, we, we, we addressed the, the interrupt sharing issue. Uh, so I was re reasonably happy with the status of things at that point, but the state of happiness didn't last very long, unfortunately. <laughs> and the reason why was, was, was sort of unexpected. Um, so you may remember that 2010 was the year when Android actually got some more traction. And that, that was the, the year when Android developers from Google actually decided to submit some of their um, kernel patches for inclusion into the mainline kernel. And one of, the, one of them was related to system suspend and resume. And does anyone remember wake logs? Yeah. So, um, so, so wake logs was the was a uh, a feature that that essentially did two things. So the first first it, it solved solved the problem, and second it, it tried to do something new at the same time in one go, which usually is a bad idea. Uh, and the the idea the, the basic idea was that okay. Uh, the runtime, the working state power management, which was not called the working state power management at that time even, but that it was working state power management, is not in a good shape in Linux generally. Well, because it wasn't, because it was fresh, new, and so on. So, uh, so let's, let's try to use system-wide power management instead of, or like, or as though it was working state power management, and let's suspend the system every time nothing happens. Meaning very often. Well, fair enough. But now we have a problem because that something has to, we, we, we need a way to, 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 to know that nothing happens. Okay, so there, there has to be a mechanism that will indicate to us that nothing happens. So this is what wake logs were. So this was a mechanism by which something like a driver or a user space process or anything could say, oh, I do something or I am doing something right now, so please don't suspend. And I tried to, uh, to merge the, or they submitted the patch set implementing this feature uh, for inclusion to the mainline kernel. Unfortunately, there was, or fortunately, I don't know, so there was a, there was a, a, a very um, a lot of opposition against that. So it didn't went, it didn't go in. But the problem it solved. Well, I didn't say what problem it solved. So so the problem it solved was that during the suspend process, right here in this flow, if there is a wake up event here during that flow it should be actually handled and not discarded, which we did before. And we, we discarded the, those events because they, uh, they didn't really matter that much on, on, on PC uh, systems like my laptop because, you know, if you say press the power button, the system doesn't wake up immediately, you press the power button again and it then wake up, wakes up because the previous one might be discarded, but the second one would be, would be naughty. So, but, but on Android, and with this flow where they use the system suspend just to suspend very aggressively, like, you know, if nothing happens, this actually matters a lot. Because if you don't take the wake up events during the suspend flow into account, then you will not wake up very often. So, yeah, that, there was a problem, and, uh, and, and we addressed this 
in, in a different way through adding a wake-up framework in 2011. Uh, along with that, uh, we got the asynchronous uh, execution of, of, uh, of the suspend phase and the resume phase. So now all the callbacks for different devices could be executed in parallel with each other, and that means that meant that, they, that we saved a lot of time. And the reason why was because those callbacks, you, you know, they don't do much computations, but they wait a lot. So if, by making them wait in parallel, we could actually save a lot of time during those transitions. Come on. Okay, in 2012, we, we, we got power device support, uh, which I basically don't have to talk about that much. Uh, finally, in 2013, we added the auto, auto sleep feature, which essentially is very similar to what wake, the original wake logs patch was trying to achieve. But again, it is done in a different way. Uh, the flow changed a bit. So there was this runtime power management framework I told you about before, and it was sort of existing in parallel with this system suspend resume flow. And at one point they started to interact because people tried to use uh, runtime PM uh, callbacks and runtime PM in general in order to, ex to, you know, to implement all of those things here and those things here, which didn't work that well. And, um, and so we decided to add one more phase uh, of suspend and one more phase uh, of resume so that drivers could reuse their callbacks, their runtime PM callbacks for in those phases, and then they could just implement a pair of callbacks and use them for both runtime PM and, and system suspend resume. That still is sort of not working as intended, <laughs> but today, but at least there is, a, there is infrastructure for doing this. Suspend so to idle appeared in 2013. 14, sorry, uh, 13, actually in 2013, this is the beginning of, of 2014. So in 2013, we got suspend to idle. And that's interesting because this is like a, uh, okay, this wasn't a feature that was designed for. So I had this idea that, well, okay, so we, we, we have this suspend flow, but we, do, we don't really need to uh, take all the CPUs offline here. We, we just, we just may put them into idle states. And if, the, if your system is an SOC, and that SOC has a very deep idle state, like, like the majority of SOCs today do, then that may be just enough to, to just put them into this, this very deep idle states and, and, leave them, and leave them like that and, and then resume them. So I told about this to somebody and that person actually basically took the idea and ran with it and then submitted a patch to implement it. It was very rudimentary in, in, in the beginning because it, it only worked. So, it, you know, this is like, okay, you, you, can, you can do that on every system you want. It doesn't need any support like from the platform firmware or anything. So you can just try to do it and, and see what happens, right? So what happens in, on the majority, or what happened on the majority of systems at that time was that they would suspend pretty much, but the, the, there was no way to resume them. Um, or they would resume automatically, like, you know, uh, through a timer event or similar. Not very useful. But it was there and people could start using it. In order to make it work, uh, we had to make a lot of infrastructure changes, like for example, uh, redesign the way the wake-up interrupts were handled, uh, which I don't really have the time to talk about. But it took a lot of effort to actually make suspend to idle work, and it turned out that it was actually more difficult to get right than the full suspend. And the reason being that the platform firmware here could actually cover up for some, you know, mess up in this flow. And, and it would turn lights off anyway, right, when asked for. 
But here, the, all of the drivers can actually have to do the right thing, or the system won't resume, or we, the, 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 the power necessary to maintain the state would be greater than, than, it, than it has to be, right? Or had to be. So it is much more difficult to get this right than to get that right. 2016, um, one very important improvement, which is not, the, not reflected by any flow changes, but uh, this is uh, really, really fundamental. So uh, suspend to idle can suspend timekeeping, which means that now it can actually avoid all of the timers I was talking about before, right? Because if it suspends the timekeeping, then uh, the timers are basically taken out of the picture, timer interrupts stop working at this point. Uh, okay. Last year, some improvements again, not very crucial. And, uh, and I was happy again. Like we solved a lot of problems, like we had those uh, interrupts, wake up interrupts, we, we, had the, we, we could uh, suspend the timekeeping in suspend to idle, so, uh, so it was uh, all, all was right, but or apparently, but you should never underestimate the ability of OEMs to make your life more exciting. So somebody somewhere had the idea that well, we could basically run the power button out of an embedded controller in a laptop. Sounds great, right? So you don't need a special you know, wiring or anything for a power button. You just need an embedded controller and, and just you know, run a small pro program on it and, and then pretend that this is a power button. In the working state, it pretty much is fine, but if you suspend, then you have a problem because now your EC is generating two types of events. One type is wake up events from the power button, and the other type is random different monitoring stuff like battery status, uh, AC, you know, plug in, plug out, and then other equally interesting things. And those are not wake up events. <coughs> So that is why we had to add this particular thing here just to filter out you know, valid wake up events coming out of the EC that are generated mostly by the power button from all of the other stuff coming out of the EC. Okay, that's it, mostly. The conclusion is you know, pretty obvious. Like, if you, if you implement something, and that actually happened twice in, in, in the story I told you. So uh, the, the, first I, the first occurrence was, was, the, was the full suspend flow, and the second one was suspend to idle, and pretty much went the same way. So if you implement something, and then people start to use it, they will report problems. And then if you try to understand what happens, you develop some diagnostic stuff and then you get understanding of issues, and then you, get, you, you can change the code to address those problems and improve all of the things. And that, that's how kernel development works in general. So, that's it. A minute for questions. questions. Yeah, just a quick one. When you're filtering the uh, events coming in from the red controller on the laptop, uh, is that an SMI context or is that an actual kernel context? No, no, it is like a normal, it is, so, so the, the, what happens is that the EC is hooked up to the uh, ACPI system control interrupt. So it will just generate an SCI, but we don't handle the SCI until we enable the action handlers to run. Okay, and then we have to run the action handler for the SCI and see, oh, is this a wake up event? Oh no, so we go back to sleep, right? Any other questions? Get a round of applause, Raphael, please. Thank you.